once again to the upper room. Again, we love being with you. I uh, hope you're getting a lot out of our walk through the upper room together. I want to take you back to World War II, and when it came to Paris, there was a gentleman in Paris by the name of Pablo Picasso. Does that ring a bell, that name at all? You know, have some chime go off in your head. The great artist who actually grew up in Spain had moved to France, was in Paris, and it was a dangerous time, as you can imagine, to be in Paris. Not only that, the Germans believed, he even then was famous, they believed that his artwork was just degenerate. They, they had no appreciation for it whatsoever. And so it became commonplace for people in Paris to be pulled aside and have their papers checked, to be interrogated, uh, for their homes to be broken into. Wow, it's starting to sound like modern day America, isn't it? Anyway, P Pablo Picasso was one of those people that the Gestapo would break into his house from time to time. And I read this story and I want to relate it to you. It's just it's so intriguing. So it was 1937 when the Gestapo banged on his door and came into his flat, came into his apartment, and uh, started searching the apartment. Well, up on the wall of his apartment was his latest painting. It was a painting of a photo that had become famous of a bombed out city in Spain called Guernica. And so the title of that painting was Guernica. That was a city, I don't know if uh, Picasso had grown up in that city, but his heart went out to his fellow Spaniards as the evidence of the war was hitting home. And so he painted that picture. And when the Gestapo came in, I, I, I can't even fathom what that might be like to be interrogated, knowing that you could be drug off to a camp or to jail. And they looked up at the painting, and one of the guys in the Gestapo looked at it, pointed at that painting, and he said, Did you do that? And I, I was trying to put myself in that situation, and I think if I was Picasso, I'd say, Oh, oh, uh, well, uh, you know, I'd, I'd stumble and stammer around and say, Well, you know, it's just, uh, just a little nothing, no big deal. Instead, Pablo Picasso he looked right at the guy, and he said, No, you did that. Can you imagine the guts that had to take to say that to this guy from the Gestapo? I don't know that anything happened to him right after that, but what I love about that story is how unconventional his approach to dealing with the Gestapo was. Most people would just cower and say nothing or mumble. He just unashamedly pointed out the fact that they're the ones destroying the world. And so we're going to talk about this concept today, as you can tell by the title of our message, Unconventional. So we're in John chapter 15, and we're going to do verse 16. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up with verse 17, but we're going to focus really on one verse, John 15, 16. Let me read it to you. And uh, it may fly under the radar for most of us, the unconventional thing that is happening here, but we're going to talk about that. And in this verse, uh, we're going to deal with the question, what is unique about a follower of Jesus? All right, uh, there's probably a lot of things that are unique, but there's some specific things that happen in this one verse where Jesus speaks to his disciples uh, that really shows that there's some uniqueness about the people who follow Jesus give their whole life to Jesus. So if you will, join me as I read from verse 16, and we'll finish up with verse 17. Jesus says, You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And then verse 17 wraps it up, a command that once again we hear, This is my command, love each other. Okay. So, uh, we're going to come up with three phrases I'm going to give you that will help us understand the unique traits of people who follow Jesus. And the first one is what we're going to call humble pie. Humble pie. Have you ever had a piece of humble pie? Uh, I bet you have. I've had many slices. In fact, I've had my fill of humble pie. And that's what we see in this very first verse. Let's start with the first phrase from verse 16. And that is this. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Right there, uh, right away, what we see is some interesting things about followers of Christ. Uh, number one, uh, we are a plural. 
it's not just about an individual. When Jesus speaks to them, he is speaking to the whole group. He's not talking to one individual, and that's important, and we'll get, we'll get to that a little bit later. But secondly, their pride is threatened. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then third, there's great privilege. Can you imagine God looking right into your eyes saying, I chose you? In case you weren't with us in the last lesson, we talked about what it means to be a friend of God. And these guys have all been now called friends of God, friends of Jesus. There's a part of me that leads me to believe that if I was in that room, I might immediately start thinking pretty puffed up thoughts, right? Wow, Jesus, we've been with him three and a half years. We haven't heard him say that about anybody. We're his friends. We're pretty special. But in what Jesus says now is the idea of, I chose you, you didn't choose me. In other words, you've done nothing to deserve what you have. Let's deal with the idea of election, the idea that uh, uh, even though it's a humbling thing to be told, you didn't do anything to deserve this, there is this strength of the idea of God choosing us, and it's all throughout the New Testament. So I'm going to give you a series of verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 33 reads this way. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. God has chosen us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. In Christ, to be holy and without fault in his eyes, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. He chose us. He adopted us. That's what adoption is, right? You get to choose the child. We were chosen. We were adopted. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. God didn't adopt you. He didn't choose you because he felt obligated. The scripture right there says that he finds great pleasure in bringing his children home with him. Colossians 3 verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We are now not just a chosen people, we're a holy people. The word holy literally means set apart. We have been set apart by God. What a privilege. And finally, to 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. There it is again, a set-apart group of people, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do you see what's at work there? It's both privilege and purpose. We have the privilege of being called God's people, his holy nation, but we have the purpose of declaring his praises. There's the balanced approach all throughout scripture that when we are called, we are called along with that a, to a purpose. Verse 10 reads this way. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, if you were to review those passages we just read, there's something I've got to point out. And again, I mentioned it earlier, but we've got to land on it for just a moment. Every time we read one of those passages, it was people who were addressed, not a person. Why is that a big deal? Because you and I have, I don't know, we've been trained to read Scripture based on what it says individually to me. It's true that we can take any message from God personally, but the entire New Testament was written to people. The plurality, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. You can't get away from that. Because now we live in an individualistic society, as we've mentioned before, and our temptation, and I see it all the time, I hear it all the time, is to say it's just God and me, me and God, and I just live my life for Him, uh, alone, apart from any other people. And that is such a foreign concept in Scripture, it doesn't exist. So every time in those passages we were chosen, it was we were chosen. We belong to an, uh, an entire group of people that we can't ignore. And when we start to ignore that and just say it's just about God and me, we are absolutely missing the boat. So if, if you need to work through that, please work through that. That's why we gather in small communities because we must find our identity as his children who have been adopted, but we are children, not a child alone, doing life on our own. So today we're dealing with the question, 
What is unique about the followers of Jesus and what we get from the first part of this passage in verse 16 is that there's this beautiful blend of honor and humility. Honor and humility, they go hand in hand, which really doesn't work out well in this culture. If I'm honored, then I think I'm something special and I'm better than other people. Not in the kingdom. Honor and humility go hand in hand. The honor is I chose you, you didn't choose me. That is an honoring thing that God did for us, but it's also a humbling thing. He humbles them by saying, don't think you're in this room because of your effort. You're not. The way that applies to us is don't think we're in this position as his children because of our own effort. We're not. Pastor John MacArthur puts it this way. The knowledge that Jesus chose them salvation apart from any merit of their own eliminates any pretense of spiritual pride that they, and by extension, all believers, might otherwise feel. In other words, when he says this, I chose you, what are you, what are you so proud of? What are you so full of yourself about? So Jim Collins wrote a book entitled Good to Great, and what he was trying to research and explain to people are the details involved when a business goes from a average to good business to a great business. I've quoted him before, but I love what he found out. And what he found out was essentially these companies, these businesses, these organizations went from good to great because of one factor, and that was the CEO, the chief executive officer, the leader of that organization. And what he found to be true of all of them was really intriguing. Now, you would think that what he would find would be that these organizations are led by, you know, uh, somewhat narcissistic, uh, full of themselves kind of men. That is the exact opposite of what he found. In fact, let me read to you what he says about what he shockingly found that most of us might find hard to believe. So here's exactly what he says. These CEOs are not the charismatic, ultra-confident figures you would expect. Instead, they are humble avoid the limelight, never rest on their own laurels, and continuously try to prove themselves. They would instinctively deflect discussion about their own role. When pressed to talk about themselves, they'd say things like, I don't think I can take much credit for what has happened. We were blessed with marvelous people. We noted the presence of gargantuan ego that contributed to the demise or continued mediocrity of a company. And so it's just the opposite. So when we say there's this beautiful blend of followers of Jesus that has to do with being honored, but being humble, these people who are leading these organizations that go from good to great, as far as Jim Collins could understand, were humble people. It's not just Jim Collins that found this to be true. Simon Sinek, the uh, New York Times bestselling author, uh, wrote his book and entitled it, Leaders Eat Last. You get the point, right? Real great leaders. Well, they're following <laughs> the picture of Jesus. They don't know they are, but uh, the greatest leaders are humble men, is what Sinek says. He tells of going to a conference where the undersecretary of the military uh, was speaking. Actually, he was the former undersecretary. Uh, the year before, he had spoken there as the undersecretary of the military. Now he was just a citizen, but he was still speaking. They still wanted him to come back and speak again. He's speaking to this uh, huge room of attenders of the conference. He paused for a minute in his speech and reached down and grabbed a cup of coffee and took a sip. Interestingly, he looked at that cup and took another sip, and then he put it back down, and then he went off script. And when he went off script, something amazing happened. He said something like this. You know, he said, last year at this time, I spoke at this conference as the undersecretary of the military. He said, when I traveled here, I, I flew first class. And when I arrived at the airport, someone was there with my name being held up on a, you know, on a board. And they had a limousine for me to get into and ride to the conference. When I got to the hotel, somebody had already checked into my room for me, just handing me my keys and I went into my room. When I got up to speak on the podium, there was this beautiful ceramic cup out of which I sipped coffee. Now I look down and there's a styrofoam cup. He says, when I traveled here, I traveled coach. 
When I arrived at the airport, nobody was there to pick me up. I had to rent a car. When I arrived at the hotel, nobody had checked in for me. I had to check in for myself. And now here I am before you, and I'm sipping coffee out of a styrofoam cup. Now I want to quote what he said next. It occurs to me the ceramic cup they gave me last year, it was never meant for me at all. It was meant for the position I held. I deserve a styrofoam cup. This is the most important lesson I can impart to you all. All the perks, all the benefits and advantages you may get for the rank or position you hold, they aren't meant for you. They are meant for the role you fill. And when you leave your role, which eventually you will, they will give the ceramic cup to the person who replaces you because you only ever deserved a styrofoam cup. Isn't that great? Well, what a way to understand humility. You know, the perks you're getting, it's because of the role you're playing, is the idea. We get perks because of the role we play as children of God. Now, this undersecretary says, you'll move out of that role and you'll be back to what you deserve, a styrofoam cup. Here's the great news I have for you. You and I don't roll, we don't have to be moved out of the role of child of God. But yet, we still deserve a styrofoam cup. Because, you know what? It's a humble life Jesus has called us to. Honorable? Yes. Honorable but humble. A beautiful, beautiful mixture and blend of a follower of Jesus. So if the first phrase that comes to mind for me when Jesus addresses his disciples is a slice of humble pie, we're going to stick with that food theme. And the second phrase that comes to mind is... The proof is in the pudding. Have you ever heard that phrase before? I've heard it my whole life. The proof is in the pudding. I looked at the origin of that phrase. And you know what I found out that surprised me? That's not really the phrase. That's a morphed phrase. So I thought the phrase my whole life, I thought it was the proof is in the pudding. But the phrase is actually the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And that makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? I never understood the proof was in the pudding. I've been searching proof for inside pudding my whole life. And I, I'm going to keep trying, I think. But the word is actually, the phrase is actually, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. That is, what it means is, you can look at pudding, you can talk about pudding, you can see pictures of pudding, you can smell the pudding, you can put the pudding in the refrigerator. But until you eat it, you don't really know what that pudding is truthfully tasting like, right? It is an idiom or it's a phrase that basically means this. Proof is a verb meaning to test. The more common meaning of proof in our day and age is the noun meaning the evidence that de demonstrates a truth. The evidence. The proof is in the eating of the pudding because that's when you have evidence of truth. What is this pudding really about? I take you back to verse 16. I appointed you... Is where it starts out again. He says, I, I chose you. You did not choose me. A little bit of a humble pie there, but we're still honored. And now he says, I appointed. That word means literally, I set apart. I set you apart. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. Okay, let's stop there. Let's drop the lasting part. We'll get to that in a moment. I appointed you to produce fruit. What is fruit? Fruit is the evidence of life. It's what it is. It's the eating the pudding and saying, this is really what the pudding is about. In other words, the culture can take part in who we are and find out the truth about who we are based on their interaction with us. So what Jesus is saying is that if you are really my follower, it'll be obvious to everybody because they're going to test you and they're going to take a taste of you, literally, and they're going to understand exactly what you're made of. Now, we live in a, a time, again, when so many people inside the church say things like, well, my faith is private. Uh, I've, I've done uh, uh, memorial services for people where I've sat with the family, and, and they that's probably one of the most common things I hear. Well, you know, daddy's uh, faith was real private. You know, my husband's faith was real private. It was very personal. So nobody really knew about it. Jesus says, nah, no, my followers, it's obvious. Uh, people are going to sample your life, and it's obvious that there's evidence. Fruit is evidence of a life that comes not from ourselves, but from God. I take you back to John 15, 5. Once again, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, 
you can do nothing. Humbling, yes, but it's the reality. The fruit that we bear is because we are connected to Jesus. His Spirit lives within us, and He produces evidence to the world. The easiest connection, obviously, is the Galatians passage, which says uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You know, all those things are evidence of life. That's not what others have in their life, those who don't have the Spirit of God. Are you starting to see how unconventional it is what Jesus has said to them? First of all, it's unconventional in the sense that I chose you, you didn't choose me. That was something that was so uncommon in that day and age. Disciples went and chose rabbis. They interviewed them and they said, I want to follow you. Not in this case. Unconventionally, Jesus says, no, I choose you. And now unconventionally, there is now evidence of not just time with the teacher, but that you will have been changed from the inside out by the Spirit of God. So what's so unconventional about the life of a follower of Jesus? Again, it reflects Jesus himself being so unconventional, not doing things the way everybody else does them. But we have evidence in the form of purpose and proof. He says, I set you apart. That's purpose. I set you apart. I, I called you out of the world to give you a job. And the job is to show the world that I'm alive in you. That is the proof that you have a connection with me that others don't have. It is purpose and proof. It's this beautiful blend, again, uh, that people who follow Jesus are unconventionally living in a way that others don't necessarily understand. We tend to get impatient with this process, though, and we just rely on pursuing pleasure. The psychiatrist who survived the Holocaust uh, wrote a lot about the studies he did amongst the people in the concentration camps, because he was in a concentration camp. I want to read to you something he said that I think is really insightful regarding this. When a man can't find meaning in his life, he distracts himself with pleasure. Wow. Let that sink in. If I don't have purpose in my life, if, if I don't have a point to my life that's very clear, I'm going to fall back on just seeking pleasure. Because that's what everybody else is doing. See, as a follower of Jesus, what makes us unique is that we don't fall back and rely on pleasure. We pursue the purpose, the privilege that God has given us, and the result of that is proof. It is fruit. It is fruit that comes only from God's Spirit in our lives. So we started with some humble pie, and then we went to... Uh, uh, the proof is in the pudding, which is not really the phrase. And now we're going to move out of the uh, food district and move into the people who get us the food. That's the truckers. The third phrase that comes to mind when I think of the attributes or qualities of followers of Jesus that Jesus points out here is the long haul. The long haul. And again, we're right there in verse 16. Right there in the midst of it, I kind of skipped over the word. The word is lasting. I have set you aside to produce, there's the word, lasting fruit. Okay, first discussion question. It's taken us a while to get to it. I know you're, you're antsy to get to talking, so here you go. What do you think Jesus means by lasting fruit? Talk about that, if you will. I haven't told you where we are. Um, you don't know exactly where we are, but you, you know the setting now, don't you? <laughs> we are at Antelope Hill Orchards. Uh, we just found this a few weeks ago. You know, we, we love this time of year to pick fruit. We love to pick peaches in particular. And it's so uh, vital to us that we get to do this. On the years where we have a freeze and the peaches don't come out, it's so disappointing. Well, we were up here last week, and when we're done here, we're going to pick some more fruit and, and eat peaches like crazy because the time frame that we have to pick these peaches is so brief that we do all we can to eat as many peaches as possible in as many different forms as possible. So that's why we're here. These peaches are incredible. Now, I've never had a Georgia peach, to my knowledge. I've heard, you know, they're famous, but I happen to know a Georgia peach, our daughter-in-law, and if I remember right, I think she said that these peaches are at least as good, maybe better, than the Georgia peaches. These are incredible peaches on the western slope of Colorado. Here's the problem with them, okay? 
Uh, there's very few problems with them. The only problem is this. They don't last. They don't last. This fruit is amazing. I look forward to it every year. You know, my diabetes program takes a major hit, <laughs> but it's worth it because there's only about a four week period where we can get this fruit, this, these peaches. The problem, it's just four weeks. They don't last. Everything this world tells us to pursue does not last. Look what Jesus says. I set you apart. I appointed you to produce lasting fruit. Not just fruit. Not just evidence that I'm with you, that I'm in you, that you're living for me, that you follow me. But lasting. Things that will last forever. What a difference. Now that's incredible fruit. That is to take part in activities in the kingdom of God that will not end as soon as this world ends. And by the way, this world is going to end. I don't know if you got the note on that. This world's going to end. And it's not because we're driving the wrong cars. It's going to end when he decides it's going to end. And it will end. But the things that we do in the kingdom, the kingdom activities, the kingdom relationships, the word of God, which is foundational to the kingdom, will last forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of God lasts forever. It's lasting. So that begs the question, is what you're involved in, your everyday activities, are they going to last? The relationships, will they last? So the idea of lasting fruit brings to mind this beautiful blend of endurance and resilience. Endurance means it lasts a long time. Resilience means even in momentary setbacks, it bounces back. That's the follower of Jesus. And that is so unconventional to this world, right? This world is all about the here and now, the momentary. Just do what feels good right now. We have been called to produce lasting fruit. Not fruit that just lasts four weeks, but lasting fruit that lasts forever, endures the time is resilient when the storms come. Let me read to you again from James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect effect, so that you will be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. Do you realize how common, how conventional it is in this culture to quit. We quit all the time. I was rereading a book the other day called Wild Things. It's a book written about raising boys, which, as you know, is a huge interest of ours. And uh, a psychologist and a pastor team up together, and in it is a story where a psychologist says he was talking to a friend of his who was talking about how disappointed he was with his life, how he's just kind of going through the motions, checking off the box, going to work, coming home, just so routine, no real passion, no real life in his life. And his psychologist friend asked him, he said, well, can you remember back to when you had a zeal and passion in life, something you really enjoyed? And the guy said, yeah, I think it was when I was playing baseball when I was a kid. Now, this isn't just about another baseball story. It's about the fact that many of us can have to go clear back to when we were kids to find, oh, that's when I was really living, when I was just having fun, enjoying this life. And he went on to say, so what caused you to stop playing baseball? Because he had told him he had stopped playing baseball. I won't go into the details of the story, but basically you overheard some coaches who in the locker room, and they didn't know he was there, he was around the corner, who were talking about him and said he's a good player, but you know what, he's, he's just too small, he'll never have the frame to be big enough to be any really good in baseball. And he heard that, and it, the psychologist is talking about the fact that we, we get named when we're young. People say things about us, and we take that on, on as an identity, and he immediately, even though he was a very good baseball player and loved it, he quit. Because he had heard some coaches say he'll never amount to anything. And he quit when he was 14. And he says, I wish I hadn't. There's so many times, I'll bet you you can talk uh, amongst yourselves about how many times you've quit something and you wish you hadn't. Uh, if I've known a, a one person, I've known a hundred people who wishes they hadn't quit playing the piano. <laughs> uh, I, I played piano for like six weeks and I wish I wouldn't have quit. 
But the point is this, we quit at so many things. We quit at school, we quit at relationships, don't we? Uh, we quit at church. Uh, commonly, we understand now that uh, even though in the past the number was 60, 50 percent of the kids who were going to church as kids said they'll stick with church after they leave high school, 15 years ago that number went down to 33 percent and now I believe it's probably in the teens. I guess someplace around 15 percent of the kids who are part of the church as kids say, yeah, this will always be a part of my life. It's really important. They know right up front, I'm probably not going to stick to this. Marriage. People don't stick to even the idea of marriage anymore. Two-thirds of all couples will cohabitate, will live together before they get married, if they do get married. And we have 46% who will get divorced, and uh, on their second try, it'll be like 62%. On their third try of marriage, it's 73% of people who get divorced. Now, why, why is there divorce? They asked Jesus that. Remember what he said? They said, well, well, if we're not supposed to get divorced, if we're supposed to stay one, why did Moses give us a certificate of divorce? And Jesus' response is classic. He said, it was never meant to be that way, but it was because of the hardness of your hearts. We quit on marriage. We quit on so many things because our hearts grow tired and weary. We're bored. Uh, we're, we've been offended, right? There are so many reasons why we quit of what we do. Discussion question. I didn't even plan for this one, but I think it's a great time for a discussion question. Talk about something that you quit at some point in life that you now wish you hadn't quit. So we've become a culture of people who are quitters. Uh, we do something until we don't want to do it anymore and we quit. We do something until someone offends us and we quit. We do something until we don't feel like it anymore and we quit. That's the modern church for sure. We are a part of a group of people until, uh, I just don't feel like it anymore. I want to read to you from Eugene Peterson in his book, and I mentioned this book before, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. He says, Our attention spans have been conditioned by 30-second commercials. It is not difficult in such a world to get a person interested in the message of the gospel, but it is terrifically difficult to sustain the interest. Millions of people in our culture make decisions for Christ, but there is a dreadful attrition rate. Many claim to have been born again, but the evidence for mature Christian discipleship is slim. You got to know as a pastor over all these years, three, three and a half decades plus, one of the most difficult things that I uh, routinely uh, have been used to doing is listening to the excuses people give for why they're not part of the fellowship. You know, they have all these reasons why they're not part of the fellowship. They feel like they have to tell me. And I, the hardest thing is to keep a straight face at these ridiculous reasons why people can't be a part of the community of faith, why they can't be a part of the, the people, the chosen people. And then I have to go home and pray for them. That they'll actually find the reason to be a part of a fellowship. God. Any other reason is going to falter. It's going to... It's going to be something you'll decide to quit on, you know. I ran into a, a guy just yesterday in Walmart who said he went to a different church because he likes the music. He'll like the music there until the music changes. You know, we have all these reasons why we're part of fellowships. Unfortunately, for most of us, God is not the reason. And so we fall into this thing where producing lasting fruit is not just not common. It's so unconventional that it seldom happens. Okay, let's get to the so what. The so what is so what. So what, Steve? So so Jesus did things unconventionally. Uh, so he's called us to live unconventional lives. So what? Let me get very specific with something Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. Time and time again in the Sermon on the Mount, he would use this phrase. You have heard it said, what I tell you. Okay? You have heard said represents conventional wisdom. Here's the conventional wisdom out there. Here's what everybody's doing, what everybody's saying, okay? But I tell you, I'm telling you there's an unconventional way that I'm calling you to live. So I want to kind of get towards the end here by giving you five conventional wisdom ideas. Five things that this world consistently tells us are the way to live. And then I'll give you the unconventional wisdom part of it that Jesus proclaims. Okay, so the first line of conventional wisdom that's pretty obvious in this culture is stay in step with the culture. All right, keep up with what's going on, right? If the new iPhone is out, get the new iPhone, right? If the new movie is out, see the new movie. 
Uh, I'm not going to go, I could really offend a lot of people now, but you know what I'm talking about. Stay in step with the culture. Unfortunately, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, actually, you're supposed to swim against the stream of the culture. The unconventional wisdom is to do the opposite. So here's the encouragement from Jesus. Watch what the culture's doing. Go the opposite direction. That was actually one of our, we had several values as a family. That was one of our values. Watch the culture. Go the opposite way. Not a bad idea if you're committed to unconventional wisdom living. As Jesus was. The second phrase that uh, jumps out from our culture regarding conventional wisdom is this, I am in control of my life. I am in control of my life. That's what everybody believes. The truth is, as a follower of Jesus, it's just the opposite. Unconventional wisdom is, I'm not in control of my life. He's in control of my life. That's why he says in this verse, I have appointed you. I have decided for you to do this. Unconventional wisdom is, I'm not in charge of my life. He is. That's what the term Lord means. You're boss. You run my life. You sit in the driver's seat. I move over to the passenger seat. The third phrase I want to throw out to you that is conventional wisdom of this culture is appearance is everything. You know this to be true. Uh, if, if you didn't believe it wasn't true, then why do you have a hundred mirrors in your, in your house? <laughs> uh, appearance is everything. And talk about the flow of the culture. You know, and, and again, I, I'm not going to try to offend anybody here, but, uh, you know, the, the big deal now is tattoos, right? That's a big deal. I don't care if you have a tattoo, but that's the big deal. Christy and I were in a Walmart in Denver, and uh, we both saw this gal at the same time. She looked like she was maybe in her mid-30s, late-30s maybe. And she had a little girl with her, her daughter, I'm sure it was. She was kind of holding her hand. The daughter looked to be about four or five years old. And then we couldn't help it. On her shoulder was the most wicked tattoo either of us probably had ever seen. It was just startling. And all of a sudden, you know, you start going, how did that happen? You know, well, most likely, I mean, I don't know the gal. I'm not judging her, but most likely she was out on a, you know, drunken stupor with some friends on a night on the town. And, hey, it was a good idea. And she had this wicked tattoo put on, you know, skull and crossbones and more and more and more. And now, how does she explain that to her four-year-old daughter? That Her four-year-old daughter has to live growing up staring at that every single day. Uh, but it's about appearances, right? I want you to see on me something special. See the difference? Unconventional wisdom tells us we, I'm already special. I'm already special. I don't have to mark up my body. I don't have to get certain clothes. I don't have to have a certain house or a certain car. I'm special. I was chosen. I'm honored. And yet, it's very humbling to know he chose me. This was not my doing. I tend to agree with Sebastian Maniscalco, the... Uh, kind of the uh, edgy comedian that says, uh, in talking about tattoos, why would I put a bumper sticker on a Ferrari? Isn't that a great line? <laughs> the unconventional wisdom for those of us who follow Jesus is that we're building a portfolio of lasting fruit. This will take time. It's not an instant, you know, drawing on my shoulder or my back. It's not an instant purchase of a car. This will take time for it to be fruit that lasts, but that's what we're about. And that bridges into the fourth phrase, this conventional wisdom of this culture, and that is live for the here and now. Live for the here and now. I mean, whatever feels good right now, do it, right? That, that phrase has been around since I was a little kid. If it feels good, do it. All that matters is that I'm happy right now. Unconventional wisdom is what Jesus said. It's lasting fruit. It's uh, about a kingdom that will last forever. And we live with the long view in mind. And that's a challenge. How are you doing at living with the long view in mind? What is it you ultimately want to accomplish? Live your life so that whatever it is you felt God is wanting you to accomplish in the long run, you can get there from here is the idea. You'll never get there from here by just doing what feels good right now or doing what seems right right now. And the fifth line is pretty easy. It's to be self-serving as opposed to being serving of Christ. Conventional wisdom says, I will always live life based on what's best for me. And uh, obviously we are called to something different. That's unconventional wisdom. And Jesus is constantly, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, throughout everything he taught, everything he did, it was unconventional. The things he did, the choosing of disciples, unconventional. Nobody did that, right? Uh, the things he taught, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
Blessed are those who mourn. That is unconventional, is it not? But that's who Jesus is. That's who we are to be. An unconventional people, that's one of the greatest qualities of followers of Jesus, is that we live unconventional lives. People surrender everything to go live in a distant land so that they can be a part of kingdom-growing processes with a people that they don't know in a language they have not yet learned. Everything about living for an unseen God who appeared 2,000 years ago is unconventional. Okay, let's end with two discussion questions now. Are you ready? In what ways have you settled for conventional wisdom living? Can you think about that? In what ways do you do what the world expects us to do? What is normal? You know, from the time we're young, we just want to be normal. We just want to fit in, right? What do you do that is conventional wisdom living? Second question, go to the opposite end of that. What is it you're doing in your life right now that is unconventional? It's unconventional according to the world's standards. Because that is what God has called you to. And you deserve a hug. You deserve a pat on the back. You deserve a high five, a knuckles for doing the unconventional thing. Now, before we wrap this up, let me just uh, throw this out there, and this won't surprise you. That is one of the things I love about what we're doing in the upper room. Conventional wisdom says that you drive down the road to a building, uh, you go to, get out, you go into the building, get some coffee, you sit down on a padded pew or chair, you listen to some good music, you listen to a, hopefully a good sermon, you evaluate it, you shake the guy's hand when you leave, and you go on with your life. That's conventional wisdom for a Christian in this day and age. What I love about what I read in the book of Acts is it's so unconventional. People met from house to house. That's why we meet from house to house. From time to time, they got into a bigger gathering. What we do, we do that at the end of the month for those of us in the Montrose churches. Uh, we expect people to share their life, to be honest about who they are, to be honest about their, their needs and their hurts and their pains and their sorrows. Uh, we eat together. And we do life together. That's not conventional wisdom of Christianity today. It's very unconventional. When I tell people, they ask me, what are you doing? You know, I run into people all the time and say, I haven't seen you for a long time. What are you doing? When I share how unconventional it is, what it is we're a part of in the upper room, most of them, they either you know, kind of cock their head and go, huh. Or they go, oh, cool. We really think it's cool when other people do unconventional things, right? I love that about what we're doing, what God is leading us to do, what you're a part of. We're having so much fun. I hope you're enjoying this. On June 2nd of 2016, a guy passed away. He was 88 at the time. His name is John Robertson McKilkin. You may or may not have heard of McKilkin. Uh, he was a Bible College president up until 1990 at, I think it was Columbia Bible College. John met his wife when they were in high school, and they had a wonderful life together. She was uh, a very vibrant, personable person. And they both were kingdom people. They went to, I believe it was Japan as missionaries. And in 1968, they returned back to the States where uh, John became the president of that Bible college. In 1981, they received some really tragic and disturbing news that she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So for the next several years, he tried to help her but maintain his job as president of the college. And as she got worse and worse, she felt so alone when he wasn't there that she would oftentimes walk the mile to the college just to see him and walk back. One night, as he had come home and was kind of tucking her in bed, he noticed that her feet were bloody. And it, it occurred to him what had happened. She had walked between home and the college so many times to see him that she had blisters that were bleeding. And here's what John said. I want to read this quote to you. He said, I wish I loved God like that, that I was desperate to be near him at all times. What an interesting approach. What an unconventional approach, right? Don't you wish that my relationship with Jesus, don't you wish that your relationship with Jesus was such that you would do anything to be near him all the time? As his wife Muriel began to lose her speech, the last words that she could say were, I love you. And she would say that often to John. Well, John had a decision to make. You see, the college needed him 100% of his time, and his wife, Muriel, needed him 100% of his time. And for him, he said it was really no decision at all. He quit 
his role as president of the college to stay home and care for Muriel 100% of the time. Now, I don't know if you know the statistics, but they're a little alarming. Statistically, four out of five men, when they are given tragic news and need to be taken care of, four out of five times the wife will stay home with them full time and take care of them. It's just the opposite for those of us who are men. Four out of five times when our wives are given such difficult news and need to be taken care of, four out of five times men do not stay. In fact, they leave. That wasn't the case with John. He did the unconventional thing and he stayed home with her. I want to read exactly what he wrote so you can understand his heart. It is clear to me that Muriel needs me now full time. My decision was made in a way 42 years ago when I promised to care for Muriel in sickness and in health till death do us part. So as a man of my word, integrity has something to do with it. But so does fairness. She has cared for me fully and sacrificially all these years. If I cared for her for the next 40 years, I would not be out of her debt. Duty, however, can be grim and stoic, but there is more. I love Muriel. She is a delight to me. Her childlike dependence and confidence in me, her warm love, occasional flashes of that wit I used to relish so much, her happy spirit and tough resilience in the face of her continually distressing frustration. I don't have to care for her. I get to. It is a high honor to care for so wonderful a person. So John became a full-time caretaker of his wife Muriel. And when people would ask him, is it hard having to do that? His answer was, no. I love Muriel. She is my precious. Pretty unconventional, isn't it? Not for a follower of Jesus, though. As followers of Jesus, we follow the one, the unconventional God, who not only chose us, but served us and had his son die for us. In the name of that unconventional God, isn't it time you and I make sure that we live unconventional lives? I pray that this is a beginning of a whole new outlook on how to live for Jesus. Thanks for being with us.